So I wanted to think about or discuss what might be up and coming in the world of science that could perhaps in the near term be translated into clinical practice to help us either predict which people who may be at risk or may be having prodromal symptoms are likely to convert to more classic psychosis or a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, or to comment on whether or not it's possible to have a lab test that will help us to diagnose schizophrenia. So with those, and it's all very tricky, um, but I'm gonna get into some of the tricky parts of it and then I'll tell you hopefully some things that you'll at least find interesting and, and possibly useful in practice. So the, the, the question in psychiatry for um, a very long time, I wanna say like 40 or 50 years that I, at least in the history that I've read, is can we come up with a laboratory test like a blood test or a, or a gene test that can diagnose a mental illness? Um, we can talk about can we detect schizophrenia by lab testing, but you could really insert any diagnosis where it says schizophrenia here. And I, I, I was thinking about this and I thought to myself that the history of lab tests for diagnosis in psychiatry really to me sounds like the natural clinical history of bipolar disorder. Um, you will, we've had many cycles uh, in which this has gone on. Somebody will discover something, whether it is, um, you know, a pink spot in urine samples of people with schizophrenia, um, which got the name adrenochrome, and led to some enthusiasm that we might be able to detect schizophrenia by a urine test, or whether it's something like the dexamethasone suppression test of cortisol levels in blood um, to diagnose depression. What the pattern is, somebody comes up with a report that says, we did this lab test and we found it in a whole bunch of people with insert diagnosis there. Um, that tends to ignite a lot of excitement in the field uh, a lot of research gets done, a lot of money gets spent to do that research, and then as we do more testing of more people, then we usually find that the biomarker, for example, dexamethasone suppression test, actually is not present in all people with the diagnosis um, that is targeted. And furthermore, we see it in many people that have other diagnoses, and we even see it in people that have no diagnosable psychiatric condition. So then comes a period of guilt, recrimination, remorse, um, and, and the field actually goes dead. Nobody, nobody who wants to do biological marker research can get funding for their studies for decades or, or about a decade until the next big thing comes around. So that's the way the cycle goes. And um, I'm not gonna talk about my own my own research in this, other than to say that I've done a good number of studies looking at the ability of niacin to cause a skin flush, um, and that ability is absolutely impaired in about 30% or so of people with schizophrenia. So that is a biomarker that I have some familiarity with. Um, and that's how I know about the funding problems and so forth. But, but it's because I, having thought a lot about this kind of problem, here's, this is actually the wrong question to ask. Um, because if you, want to, if you want to have a lab test and hold it to the standard that it, hold it to the standard that it has to have a high sensitivity and a high specificity to match a DSM diagnosis, good luck to you. Um, because no diagnostic, entity in DSM is actually based on any physiological consideration. Uh, the DSM started off saying we are atheoretical and we are not going to dive into the possible biological underpinnings of these things. Um, as everybody knows, DSM diagnoses are based upon um, symptoms like types of thoughts, types of moods, or types of behavior, or types of speech. And all of these individual symptoms have dozens of contributing factors. So, you know, if you, if you think about it, you'll probably be convinced that you will never find that physiology matches up precisely with our sort of preconceived notion about what an illness criteria should be. Um, and that's probably why we have this history of, I found a marker, well, it's not that good. Um, so if that's, so 
to can we get a test that will diagnose a DSM entity is just the wrong question. This is the right question to ask. And, and um, this is where we are in a cycle now in history where I we're back where biomarkers and studying them is in favor. And I think this time it's going to stick and actually has the that plus emer some emerging drugs in the pipeline for psychiatric um, conditions, I think is gonna set the stage so that we can in the next maybe 10 years um, start to develop personalized medicine and psychiatry based on biological or other markers. So these are the questions that we're gonna get at. Can we, can, can we imagine a test that will allow us to take a diagnosis like schizophrenia or depression or anxiety and parse it into biological subtypes? Because those biological subtypes are likely to predict clinical course and response to treatment. So what we're really interested in in biomarkers today is whether we can find such tests that will help us to categorize illness physiologically, predict course, and predict treatment response. So um, let's now take that background and apply it to how things look in schizophrenia. First, um, are there physiological subgroups within schizophrenia? This graph will say probably a whole lot of them. Um, this is an approach that these investigators um, did. They got large, large samples from clinical, clinical studies where they had genetic information and very detailed um, symptom reports or phenomenology. And this is how we might approach schizophrenia today if we hadn't, if we had just sort of realized this condition existed, you know, for the first time. We would get big data and apply um, computer assisted or artificial intelligence um, ways to parse it into naturally occurring groups. So if we were to apply those kinds of data science manipulations to the raw data that we get from genes and behaviors, then um, you can argue that there are actually 17 different diseases um, based upon non-interacting genetic and biochemical factors. Or if you want to restrict yourself to just clinical symptoms, then there would be eight clinical syndromes or eight different behavioral conditions that go under the headline schizophrenia as defined by DSM. So we're at the very beginning of deconstructing this very complicated um, condition. Here's a, for, for, for those that don't want to get into genes or, or get into that level of um, detail, this is, this is a simpler and actually comparatively speaking, a uh, much cheaper approach uh, looking just at an old-fashioned EEG. You can use old-fashioned EEG equipment and hook it up to modern computers and the computers don't have to be that big and the software is not that complicated. Um, but with that, you can take these very, the seemingly complicated EEG waves from different regions in the brain and you can do what's called Fourier transformation and try to say within this complicated waveform, what percent of this comes from slow frequency waves? What percent of this comes from medium frequency waves? What percent comes from high frequency waves? Um, and so when it says on the slide, delta, theta, alpha, beta, these are essentially very low frequency waves, less slow frequency waves, um, 12 or so um, waves per second and, and faster waves. So these are the, the frequency waves and, and the color ring shows how intense these are. So based upon these, these, these forms, um, it's possible to recognize six different electrophysiological subtypes within schizophrenia. And interestingly, you find that these six subtypes exist in people that have classic DSM schizophrenia. You also find that these six subtypes exist in people that are having alcohol withdrawal psychosis or depression-related psychosis. So it seems from, from at least this very interesting study that psychosis itself has six different electro electrophysiological types, and those types are equally represented in schizophrenia or other, other pathways to psychotic illness. So um, suffice it to say, we're at the threshold of beginning to um, do a lot of deconstructing and probably a lot of discovery. We can also, we, we're, we're farther along actually, in subtyping schizophrenia according to neurochemistry. Uh, unfortunately, these neurochemical techniques, are, they're, they're not easily deployable into clinical laboratories, but if, uh, so, so we're, they're not available to frontline clinicians in current versions yet. 
Uh, but if you look at things, if you look at um, a variety of neurochemical techniques, um, pr pretty clearly and consistently, no matter what the approach, you get the same result. And that is to say that what we call schizophrenia um, can be cut into a high dopamine kind and a normal dopamine kind, or type or a type A, type B. Um, I, just to make it memorable, I say high dopamine and dopamine irrelevant schizophrenia. Um, and, and it makes sense then that the kind of schizophrenia that has excessive dopamine signal, and more specifically, the people who are able to synthesize greater quantities of dopamine, able to release greater quantities of dopamine, um, those individuals actually have fairly good and fairly reliable response to frontline first approach antipsychotic drugs, in other words, dopamine antagonists. So that stands for reason. Dopamine blockers are good for excessive dopamine illness. And this group, type B, the one that have normal dopamine signaling, tend to be the ones that don't respond to the dopamine blocking drugs. Um, so there's that. And to take that further, um, as a pharmacologist, I will continue to say drugs are used both to treat people and try to help them make them well. Drugs also, all times and everywhere, are trying to tell us stories. They're trying to report to us what's happening in the systems that we launch them into. And looking at drug response and then looking at some biomarkers, we find this very interesting pattern um, where those who are rapid and robust responders in row one turn out to have biomarkers of high dopamine turnover. Um, if you do serial or repeated CT scans, you'll find that their brain volume looks stable. And if you look for biomarkers of inflammation like interleukins in the cerebrospinal fluid, they, they, are, they look normal. There's another pharmacological pattern in which the same first-line antipsychotic drugs turn out to have very good clinical response, but rather than unfolding over days or weeks, they unfold over the course of months, um, two to four months uh, to be precise. And you find in these slow responders that they actually don't have signs of high dopamine. They, they, they appear to be the so-called type B. Um, but they do appear to have unstable, you know, fluctuating brain volumes, probably related, probably this is a biomarker of inflammation, a structural or imaging biomarker of inflammation. And indeed, if you look at their cerebrospinal fluid, you'll find that these slow responders are in fact showing elevated levels of inflammatory cytokines. And then you have um, the, the third type not responding to frontline drugs. Um, within this group, you find um, no, no signs of inflammation and no signs of dopamine, um, of dopamine excess. And within this group of three, you'll have clozapine responders and clozapine non-responders. So um, actually drugs tell us that there are four different um, illnesses that go under the headline diagnosis of schizophrenia. So um, to come back to, these are some evidence that there are in fact different physiological groups within this headline diagnosis and there are multiple ways to parse out these physiological subgroupings and stay tuned because we will, I, I, I will firmly predict that within the next 10 years, we will be able to parse them out and we can say things like dopamine psychosis, glutamate psychosis, inflammatory psychosis, and so forth. Um, what about then, where are we with, can we use these, any laboratory tests to predict clinical course or response to treatment? Um, and not quite yet. So far, so far, the best predictors are clinical or demographic variables. Um, but here's what's in the works. Of course, we live in the age of big data, big computers, and and informatics, um, and that that um, information technology is well suited to what are called omics, omics um, neurochemical or omics chemical approaches. So we can we can use. Um, genomic, which is to do wide-scale screening of genetic outputs, uh, proteomic, in which these are tests that we can measure hundreds or thousands of proteins within a biological sample. We can do it with a lot of uh, lipid panels. We can do it with what's called metabolomic. So we can look at um, product byproducts of metabolism. And again, you can measure simultaneously hundreds of uh, metabolic uh, 
um, outputs. You can measure hundreds of inflammatory signals. You can measure in, in imaging studies with, with um, MRI, you can look at, pat at white matter or connection patterns between brain regions. So these are called connectomes when you, get, when you start to look at those in the hundreds. Um, so we can generate we can generate hundreds of thousands of biological signals. And the, the hope is that through network analysis or other sorts of um, data, data mining technologies, we can discover naturally occurring groupings of these things, which then will um, perhaps lead to predicting who might develop schizophrenia or uh, people that do have schizophrenia, what would be the likely, the, the likely clinical course and response. So this is in the works, uh, stay tuned there. And what is probably even closer to clinical deployment is a not difficult to do variation of ordinary MRI systems. So you send somebody for MR, for magnetic resonance imaging, um, what happens is the patient lies in a, in a narrow tube and there's an intense magnetic field. That magnetic field is supposed to flip all the protons, um, all the hydrogen atoms in the person's brain or body into one direction. So they're all pointing in the same, the same, um, the same direction within this intense magnetic field. But what happens next is that radio waves get passed through the patient and at certain radio wave energies, those those um, nuclei will flip their orientation. And when they flip, the radio wave energy is absorbed, so the output is decreased at the, at the receiving antenna, and then you can use computers to generate the locations and generate images for us. Um, but exactly the same system can be used to say um, how much energy was required to flip a hydrogen atom or a phosphorus atom, uh, for example, and those there are ways that you can use that energy information to figure out the concentrations of certain kinds of chemicals like the neurotransmitter glutamate or its metabolites or other amino acids or phospholipids or choline or um, other sorts of things. So, so we can actually measure concentrations of interesting bio, biochemicals within living human being brains with equipment that we already have. Um, and doing this in the schizophrenia space, we find fairly consistently that if people have elevated levels of glutamate in their anterior cingulate gyrus, these are the individuals that tend to be not responding to dopamine blocking drugs, first line antipsychotics. These people actually tend to be more, more likely to respond to clozapine. So um, it probably just, I don't know, um, is maybe it's a matter of patenting, marketing, or other sorts of things before we can send people to MRI tubes um, and help us to know who's likely to be a clozapine responder. Um, that's if we have the, I don't know, the, the, the marketing or the um, financial um, requirements met, we, we could probably deploy that soon. So, um, my 15 minutes of talking are almost done, so I will close here. Um, we, we, we don't have an ability yet to be able to predict who's going to wind up developing schizophrenia. The best we can do so far is to say people that are having prodromal symptoms um, or attenuated symptoms of psychosis, we might be able to make with 30% precision a, a prediction of who's going to develop um, full psychosis within a year. Um, but stay tuned because we're, we're um, getting closer and closer to being able to um, parse this out into physiological um, biomarkers. And with that, um, pairing with drugs that say target serotonin system or glutamate system, or uh, maybe inflammatory system, uh, we will probably be able to um, figure out better medicines based upon physiological um, subtyping at the onset of illness. So that's the end 